This week we are extremely lucky to have Dr. Ellen Schrecker of Yeshiva University and Stern. Am I right about that? Well, Yeshiva University and Stern. Um, who is, from my perspective, and of course I have to admit I'm a friend of hers, so I may be somewhat biased, is probably the nation's foremost scholar of McCarthyism. Having begun her investigation of McCarthyism with a book called No Ivory Towers about the failure of the universities to protect the centers in the 1950s. Later gone on to write a book, Many Are the Crimes, about McCarthyism in general. Served a stint as the editor of Academe, the organ of the American uh, Association of University Professors. And we are very fortunate we were able to prevail upon her to share our ongoing research about the struggles over academic freedom in the 1970s. Um, our class, the rest of you may not know about this, but we urge you to check it out, have just read the Powell Memo, a famous memo by a man who later went on to be the Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell, submitted a memo to the Chamber of Commerce decrying the dangerous influence of radical leftists in all walks of life in the United States, and he urged the business community to organize and fight back. And boy, did they. And Dr. Schrecker is going to tell us part of that story relating to the 1970s and beyond. So without further ado, Dr. Ellen Schrecker. OK, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Um, well, it is a great pleasure to be here at John Jay. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Michael and Jerry, for having me here. Um, one of the first books that was written about the 1970s had the amazing title, It Seemed Like Nothing Happened. Well, I think we know better now. and. If we look at the 1970s from the perspective of higher education, we see that quite a lot happened. And we also kind of see that dividing time by official decades doesn't really work, especially for this period. We're really looking at something we could call the long 60s that began around 63, 4, 5 and continued through until the mid-1970s. So that when we're looking at the 1970s as a decade with regard to higher education, we're looking at a period that was a major transformation and a period that was definitely, uh, for higher education, a period of transition. Transition, for example, from left-wing political activism on American faculties to a right-wing backlash against that activism and against universities in general. Uh, we're looking at a transition from a period of expansion in higher education to one of contraction and cutbacks. We're looking as well at a period of transformation and transition with regard to the mission, the stated mission of higher education. In an earlier period, um, universities sort of dedicated themselves to the transmission and creation of knowledge. But during the 1960s and early 70s, under the pressure of many social movements, uh, it moved away from that traditional mission toward one of expanding access and making education relevant, and I put that word relevant in quotes, to the daily lives of those students who are singing along with Pink Floyd, we don't want, need no education. Um, and we're looking as well at a period of transition with major intellectual changes in many of the academic disciplines. But, and this is probably most important, we're seeing a major transformation 
and major structural changes that as a result of the economic crisis of the 1970s. And somehow I want to look at all of these changes within academic, uh, within the academic community with a special emphasis on faculty members. Why faculty members? Well, I'm writing a book about them, but also because they are the people who've made the, who are really perhaps the most important set of quote unquote stakeholders within higher education, people who've made a lifetime, full-time commitment to American higher education and are, for that reason, perhaps most affected by the transformations that we're going to be looking at. So let's begin by taking a look at the demographics, at the kinds of people who are here on American campuses in the late 1960s and 1970s. And what we're seeing is American colleges and universities um, trying to digest the massive expansion that took place in the 1960s when not only were lots of new institutions founded, but also older ones changed their missions. You had a lot of uh, small state teachers' colleges suddenly becoming liberal arts colleges and then becoming uh, full-blown universities. You had new kinds of students coming onto campuses, more of them and more different types, older students, students with working class backgrounds, and of course you had the universities trying to adjust to these new students as well as to try to uh, adjust their previously all white campuses to a new cohort of minority group students emboldened by the civil rights and black power movements. Faculties expanded as well. And what we're seeing are many, many more younger people, people like us, our age, but much younger, who have come to, uh, through graduate school, often because there was an effort to lure them in with fellowships, if not uh, draft exemptions, so that what you had was new, larger faculties composed of younger people, more than half of whom did not have tenure. Meanwhile, the Vietnam War is continuing, and the anti-war movement will, in fact, reach a kind of peak in the early 70s. Um, it's a movement that in this period is being transformed in three ways. Uh, transformed on America's campuses, that is. In the first place, it's going to spread from the elite colleges and flagship state universities where it began in the early 60s to smaller, less prestigious schools. and it, um, all over the country, and it spread so much that um, President Nixon was unable to go to his daughter's graduation from Smith College because he would face a demonstration and was so afraid of facing demonstrations that, um, you know, presidents uh, often give commencement addresses, and he wanted to give a commencement address, but he was really too terrified of what might happen, so he ended up at a uh, school you've all heard of, General Beadle State Teachers College in South Dakota. This is the only school he could go to without uh, facing some kind of student demonstration. At the same time that the anti-war movement spread to other campuses, it also became very respectable more and more Americans, elite Americans, were now against the war, to such an extent that by uh, late in 1969, you had uh, groups of college presidents petitioning 
the White House to demand an end to the Vietnam War. These are college presidents. At the same time, you're also seeing an incredible radicalization um, and an escalation in the militancy of anti-war activists on campus. Uh, by the early 1970s, these are people who had been protesting for years, demonstrating for years, and the war was still going on, and they became increasingly more frustrated and increasingly more radicalized, um, and increasingly more critical of the entire American system, including the institutions within which they were working. Um, many of them felt that uh, their colleges and universities had somehow participated and collaborated uh, in the war effort by doing research for the military or allowing the uh, Reserve Officers Training Corps, the ROTC, to uh, uh, give ca uh, classes on campus. And many of these people were much more willing to confront the authorities, um, even to take over buildings, and in some cases, to even use violence. And it was not just students. Just to give you one example, um, in the spring of 1970, um, February and March, before the invasion of Cambodia, a group of faculty members at SUNY Buffalo took over the administration building. This is faculty members uh, trying to pressure the president of the school to withdraw the uh, Buffalo police, city of Buffalo police, who had been on campus full time for several weeks. Um, they didn't succeed. They were arrested, 45 faculty members arrested. Um, and so, Things had gotten so intense that by the time Nixon invaded Cambodia in late April 1970, just about every campus exploded with some kind of incident or demonstration um, on those campuses, uh, culminating, as you well know, with the shooting of four people by the Ohio National Guard at Kent State University on May 4th, 1970. Um, this was happening everywhere. At NYU, for example, I'm just looking at a case where a group of students and one faculty member took over the computer. And what you have to realize is that in 1970, computers were not your little teeny MacBooks. They were whole big rooms full of machines, and this group of radicals took over the NYU computer, holding it for ransom. They wanted $100,000 for bail for the Black Panthers. They didn't get it. They were arrested, of course. Um, but they ha did have dynamite. They were really planning to blow it up. And another group, this time I don't think containing any faculty members, did blow up a building at the University of Wisconsin and inadvertently killed a, a graduate student who was working there very late at night. But within a few years, these disruptions began to die out. The United States finally withdrew its troops from Vietnam, and the war came to an end, along with the end of the draft. And college administrations became more sophisticated, more careful about who they were going to hire, who they were going to admit. Um, and they learned, in a certain way, how to co-opt radical students and faculty members. But the disruptions of the late 60s and early 70s did take a toll. Students were expelled. Faculty members lost their jobs. Um, unlike the McCarthy era, where people uh, were fired 
uh, for their resistance to external um, investigating committees like the House on American Activities Committee or Joe McCarthy, um, there were almost no uh, tenured faculty members who lost their jobs during this period. Um, maybe universities had learned not to mess with tenure, who knows. Um, in fact, the only tenured professor I know of who lost his job, and I may find others as I do more research, uh, was a Melville scholar named Bruce Franklin who was fired by Stanford in 1972 for having participated in several unruly demonstrations the previous year. Most of the people who were fired during this period were younger faculty members who had publicly sided with students in demonstrations and building takeovers. Um, most cases actually didn't involve outright dismissals. After all, these people didn't have tenure. And they were simply denied tenure or their contracts weren't renewed. Um, one man who later went on to become extremely eminent in his field was very active as a junior faculty um, member at NYU. And he recalls the university president telling him, and I quote, you can write a thousand books and become a brilliant scholar, but your days at NYU are numbered, and they were. Um, usually, college administrators were not so open about the explicitly political reasons for firing these uh, younger scholars. They tended to give a much more academically respectable uh, excuse. You know, somebody hasn't progressed enough in writing his PhD thesis, poor teaching, inadequate research, who knows? Or as one uh, left-wing Harvard professor who did get tenure explained, people who took uh, unpopular political positions were often viewed, in his words, as, quote, having a second-rate mind which is what you say, he continued, when you disagree with somebody, because um, you can't say, I disagree with you, with the person politically. You say, it's clear he has a second-rate mind. Uh, how many of these, quote unquote, second-rate minds were uh, dismissed, we don't know. Um, and one reason is that many of these people were able to get other jobs. Uh, because the universities were still expanding. And some schools actually wanted to get left-wing uh, faculty members. They went out of their way to recruit them because it gave their school a kind of hip reputation. They could attract better students if they had a little action on campus. Not too much, of course, but a little bit. Um, even so, the people who were involved in the most notorious of these academic freedom cases were blacklisted. Bruce Franklin, for example, could not get a job for many years, and some never did return to academic life. Um, one of them was a man by the name of Stoughton Lind, uh, who was a very dedicated political activist, both in the civil rights movement and then uh, in the anti-war movement and had actually gone to Hanoi in North Vietnam uh, at the height of the war. And uh, then, for some funny reason, was just let go by Yale and was never able to get another teaching job in his field of history again. He ended up going to law school and becoming a labor lawyer. Um, at the same time, during the 1970s, um, many of these radical academics were active in, beyond their institutions, not just in the anti-war movement off campus, but also within their disciplines where they began to challenge traditional scholarship and also to work 
within the professional organizations in their field, like in my field of history, the American Historical Association, or for literary scholars, the Modern Language Association, uh, radicals began to form little caucuses within these organizations, trying to get them to take uh, stands on the war, take stands on other pressing issues, especially um, issues that might uh, be relevant to their field, so that, uh, for example, uh, anthropologists tried to get their uh, professional organization to condemn working for the CIA, things like that. Um, and some of these um, radical caucuses within the disciplines did have some success. For example, literary scholars within the um, MLA uh, did pass an anti-war resolution and actually elected one of the more radical scholars as their president for 1970. The uh, historians ran Stoughton Lynn for president of the American Historical Association and did not win. Um, these radical caucuses organized little conferences. They uh, began to publish scholarly journals and they embarked on campaigns that were relevant to their fields. And there are dozens of these. There was the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, which was very important in early anti-war activities because they knew about East Asia. Uh, there was a group called Science for the People that um, in the early 1970s became very critical of uh, corporate control of science, of uh, those scientists who worked on things like biological warfare. Uh, there was something called the um, sociology liberation movement and um, the Union of Radical Political Economists in Economics and lots of other fields, almost every field had a radical group. Uh, besides working within their disciplines, many of these radicals uh, began to change the actual content of their teaching and scholarship. There was a revival of Marxism. Marxism was a dirty word in the 1950s. Um, but by the early 1970s, just about every radical um, academic that I knew was in some kind of Marxist uh, study group. Um, within my own field of history, people became involved in social history, looking at the history of um, more marginalized groups, people who weren't just presidents and diplomats, but um, women, people of color, American Indians, et cetera, uh, something that one scholar has called history from the bottom up. Uh, within the field of literary studies, you have the expansion of the canon, as it was called, uh, bringing back uh, literature and writing by previously marginalized figures rather than the famous dead white men. Um, and of course, you had the enormous expansion of black studies, which occurred as a response to the demands of mobilized students on many campuses. Uh, as administrations were really absolutely terrified by this kind of student unrest, so they really scrambled to organize programs and hire African-American faculty members, um, although after things quieted down by the late 70s, they began to pull back and stop uh, funding many of these programs. Um, there was a similarly even huger expansion within women's studies, uh, which occurred despite an enormous amount of opposition to both the field of women's studies and to female professors um, who often had to fight for legitimacy within 
the academic community. Many traditional male scholars simply didn't think that there was anything much to women's studies. And, uh, but unlike uh, black studies, this was such a popular field. The uh, e enormous rush into classes about women's studies was such that uh, many administrators um, bucked their traditional male faculty and um, encouraged uh, the expansion of this field. Um, and as women began to uh, be energized here by the women's movement, they began to take a much more confrontational stance with regard to their institutions, especially with regard to the traditional discrimination against women on American faculties. This uh, was not always overt. Some of this was structural discrimination as, for example, with nepotism rules, rules that many universities had that simply refused to allow an institution to hire both the man and the woman in a married couple, which in New York City probably wasn't uh, too terrible, but in a more rural area or university town, it could break somebody's career, and for some funny reason, that career was always that of the woman. Uh, so, um, and um, many women came to realize how deeply embedded this um, discrimination was and began to fight against it. Uh, and I want to quote here from the, uh, a statement by Linda Kerber, one of the most important women's historians active today, who eventually became the president of just about every single one of the scholarly organizations within her field. And she notes, quote, we were not unemployed because our scholarship was weak or because we had made fools of ourselves at interviews. We were unemployed because a profession that prided itself on its commitment to the life of the mind measured its colleagues by non-intellectual criteria. And by the 1970s, this began to change. Uh, women really began to push back. Um, fairly quickly, there were over 150 um, official complaints launched with the, um, lodged with the federal government against discrimination at a whole wide range of schools from Michigan and Harvard and Columbia and University of Connecticut to CUNY, where there was a major suit, you probably were participating in it, uh, by uh, female professors at CUNY with the assistance of the federal government. Um, they collected an enormous amount of information proving that women had not been promoted uh, or paid equally with men, even though many had, been, uh, had much longer service and more publications than comparable males. Um, but unfortunately, uh, just as women and underrepresented uh, members of minority groups were gaining access to the world of higher education, what happened? The economic crisis meant that by the late 60s, that unlimited expansion of American higher education came to an end. And as one college president put it, the golden age of higher education has been transformed into an age of survival. Of course, we know that this is not unique to higher education, that it's a reflection of the broader restructuring of the American economy that was occurring at, uh, in the late 60s and, of course, the 1970s, that um, transformation in which manufacturing sector is declining, uh, there are lots of plant closings, inflation, oil crises, um, and ironically, just as good working class jobs are beginning to decline and disappear, 
there is an increasing demand for higher education as a way to make it and remain within the middle class. Um, but, of course, as the economic situation is deteriorating, many states are beginning to cut back on their support for higher education. And the financial burden of paying for that education is being increasingly put on the back of American students here. Um, in the form, of course, of ever higher tuitions. Um, the Nixon administration is kind of pushing this. They stop uh, giving money directly to institutions, which, they ha which had been happening in the 1960s, and instead are transforming uh, federal aid to higher education into packages of grants and loans to individual students so that administrations are able to tap into those students, uh, are um, going to s supplement um, the dwindling um, support from state legislatures with the tuition of individual students. Um, these new financial constraints are forcing schools to make increasingly, take increasingly drastic measures. In the early 1970s, for example, uh, CUNY tried to impose tenure quotas on its faculty. You know, only so many people could get tenure in any one year. Didn't succeed. They kept trying, but it didn't work. But later in the decade, as the city begins to face bankruptcy, CUNY begins serious retrenchments and dismisses about 1,000 people, uh, as well as imposing tuition on what had once been, uh, at what had once been uh, the greatest system of free public higher education in the world. There were similar cutbacks everywhere. And at most schools, the way that administrations dealt with that was by not replacing faculty members who retired or who were denied tenure uh, with other tenure track faculty members, but instead turning over ever more of the teaching to part-time adjuncts and people with temporary contracts. Um, as a result, within a few years, um, you no longer saw a seller's market in the academic community. In the uh, 1960s, I've been told that department chairs used to line up at academic conferences to interview job candidates. Uh, things changed, and by the early 1970s, convention hotels were full of incredibly depressed graduate students and new PhDs who discovered that the careers that they thought they were going to float into had simply disappeared. Um, some fields were really very badly hurt. One um, philosopher claims that he was told in 1977 that only 5% of the people who were getting PhDs that year in philosophy were ever going to get tenure, 5%. Um, and in response to these new corporate, uh, these new fiscal constraints, administrations became much more concerned about their bottom lines, understandably. They began to adopt business models including a kind of more top-down, hierarchical, corporate model of running their academic enterprises that increasingly sidelined uh, faculty members uh, from their traditional role in university governance, uh, something that's still going on today. And how did faculties respond to this? 
Well, the 1970s is a period in which faculty members increasingly concerned about bread and butter issues as well as governance and job security began to form unions. Um, this is something that had begun in the mid-60s when a number of states um, passed laws allowing public employees to form unions. And it accelerated in the 1970s so that in the decade from 1966 to 1975, um, it went from 11 campuses that were unionized to 430. Most of these unions were at sort of smaller, second tier uh, state schools, but CUNY was unionized, SUNY was unionized, Rutgers was unionized, and even some private universities were unionized. Um, surprisingly, um, there were quite a number of administrations that were receptive to these unionization drives. They were still under the influence of a kind of New Deal liberalism and willing to accept unions. Uh, of course, there was opposition as well, as well as opposition within the faculty. Many professors felt that unions threatened their status as professors. You know, it's okay for steel workers or automobile workers, but it's really not something that is compatible with the supposedly meritocratic system of American higher education. Uh, and this was um, not a trivial concern. Uh, during the 1970s, the AAUP decided to allow uh, some of its chapters to begin to transform themselves into uh, collective bargaining units and the organization lost about half its members, mainly people at top-tier research universities. They didn't want to have anything to do with unions. Um, and by the end of the 1970s, um, that sort of pace of unionization begins to slow down as society and the government become increasingly conservative and that conservatism increases, especially after the election of Ronald Reagan. Um, many of the problems that faculty members were facing and their universities were facing uh, with regard to the dwindling resources that uh, they were getting from uh, the states were exacerbated by an, a really growing hostility on the part of politicians, businessmen, ordinary citizens, and public intellectuals who had been upset about what had happened in the 1960s and decided that it was all the fault of these radical professors. And it's a hostility that begins very early in the 1970s. For example, the California State Legislature uh, increased, uh, passed an increased uh, cost of living um, wage for all state employees except faculty members at state colleges and universities. Um, and other states had similar attempts to uh, pass punitive measures against um, the academic community, both students and faculty. Um, this is a period, again, the early 70s, when the business community and right-wing foundations are mobilizing against um, what they consider to be the domination of American universities by militant leftists. And, um, you know, this memo by the future Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell in August 1971 is only one manifestation of the increased hostility to the academic left on the part of this sort of conservative sector of the business community. Um, uh, Powell talks about uh, 
or recommends that uh, the business community engage in a quote unquote long range and difficult project to overcome the quote unquote imbalance of the nation's faculties. What does he mean by this? What does he want? He wants a, uh, not just to have administrations and boards of trustees weed out these tenured radicals, but also to begin to create sort of counter institutions that would provide a conservative set of policy recommendations and also delegitimize mainstream academic scholarship. Um, Powell wasn't unique. Other businessmen were calling for the same thing, and they put their money where their mouth was. Uh, they gave millions of dollars, literally millions, to conservative scholars and to think conservative think tanks like the American uh, Enterprise Institution, like the Hoover Institution, a whole bunch of them developed, um, that wrote books, uh, created policy papers, held um, conferences, uh, financed professors on a wide variety of campuses, and pushed these corporate friendly ideas into American public discourse to such an extent that it did move decidedly to the right and actually convinced many Americans that the nation's faculties were hotbeds of radicalism full of cross-dressing multiculturalists and feminists who hated white men, would not support their country, and wrote incomprehensible prose. Um, within less than 20 years, that campaign actually succeeded uh, and culminated in what came to be called the culture wars of the late 1980s and 1990s. And it's a campaign that is still going on today, uh, creating a kind of vicious spiral of decreasing public support um, for higher education, um, even as that same enterprise has become increasingly necessary uh, for the attainment or maintenance of a middle class standard of living. So, in conclusion, what can be learned by the experiences of the 1970s? What, what's the legacy of that muddled decade? And of course, as a um, conscientious historian, I've got to give a nuanced answer. Uh, and it is, you know, that old half full, half empty glass. Um, on the one hand, the reforms of that decade did make American universities more welcoming to a wide range, uh, wider range of students and ideas and faculty members than before, even if so many of them were saddled with unbearable debts. At the same time, universities um, and even if some of those um, ideas that came out of the 1970s, like the need for academic relevance, uh, came to be transformed into a narrowly vocational conception of higher education's mission that not only scants the liberal arts, but also deprives students, I'm afraid, of the not inconsiderable pleasure of intellectual engagement and experimentation. At the same time, universities were opening up. Um, they were also transforming themselves uh, under these incredible economic pressures into more authoritarian, top-heavy institutions that increasingly play by corporate rules and all too often scant their traditional academic mission of serving the common good. Um, if we can ever figure out exactly what that common good might mean. 
Uh, now, I'm not sure how we can reverse this decline um, and the sort of um, uh, ending, as it were, or the end of a really full commitment by the academic community to high quality mass higher education that began in the 1970s. I just know that somehow we have to do it if we are going to maintain any kind of a semblance of a truly democratic system in the United States. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for the lecture and for being here. My name is Janet and I'm um, in Mr. Miracle's IEP class. And I'm not sure if mine is a statement or a question. Um, a couple of weeks ago I read that someone, one of the governors said that we should start charging higher tuition for what he deemed a valuable skill that you're learning in a college, for example, the STEM sciences, and charge less for that and then charge higher if anyone's gonna take a liberal arts course or a philosophy major or something like that. Mm -hmm. So here I am trying to stay in the middle class, trying to get an education, but paying on my dime. So now I'm in the middle, Should I, do I go to college for the value of it, just for me, or do I now have to worry about taking a, a course and a major that will supposedly lead to a skill and that there might be a job out there. How do you feel about the fact that someone in government, an actual, I believe he was the governor, saying mm -hmm. let's charge higher for what we deem to be a good major, you know, or, or charge, um, I'm sorry, yeah. charge less for what we deem a good yeah. major and charge more for those fluffy you right. know, philosophy classes and liberal arts classes. New Jersey's I think it's I Florida. Forgot, I forgot who Florida I think was. it's Florida. But you know, yeah. you go to Chicago and you and they do the great books curriculum yeah. and things of that nature. We started from the liberal arts. Yeah. So I guess talk on that. Right. Um, this is, of course, the interesting thing is what are the more expensive kinds of programs for colleges to um, offer? And those are usually the STEM majors that need labs, that need, you know, that need a lot of hands-on uh, time, uh, faculty time. So, um, you know, the economic rationale here is a little nuts uh, because, um, you know, it's pretty cheap to teach philosophy. You don't need a lab, just a library. Uh, and you probably don't even need textbooks because all the books are online and free. Uh, so this is uh, what is really scary here because what is happening is that the notion that higher education can be seen in such instrumental terms that it can be only for the good of the individual is really destroying what had made American colleges and universities great. And is um, in an earlier period, universities really did see themselves as having a democratic mission, creating citizenship, uh, helping people develop critical skills to, uh, and the interesting thing is that these um, so-called technical skills that people are going to get in college aren't really going to be that useful for that long, that you learn on the job. If you think of how quickly your word processing program has uh, changed, do you really want to spend four years studying something that's going to become obsolete three years later? So um, the economic rationale here isn't that useful. What you should be learning is how to learn, how to think. And um, sort of the standard uh, wisdom here is that people tend to go through about, is it six or eight different career changes over the course of their life. So what we're getting is a kind of short term uh, business mindset that has nothing whatsoever to do with education and it's going to turn out a whole lot of people who aren't very well equipped for a changing world. So, you know, I agree with you.
going to press up? Yeah. Because this is my class. Yeah. I am so concerned that, according to what you said, the way I understand it, a CUNY University is really for the, the left and Princeton for the right. Is that correct? The, uh, what you get out of it in the end, it's, it's more towards the right and the left, if you can clear that up for me. I'm not sure. I no, I'm saying the, the, the ideology. Yeah. What you get at CUNY because of the, um, the shift towards the right thinking yeah. in higher end universities compared to CUNY. Well, what actually is happening, and I'm glad you brought this up because I didn't really talk about it, is we're seeing an incredible uh, kind of polarization by class of the academic community, uh, which means that working class students, even um, middle class students who are you know, sort of hanging on by their fingernails, um, at the vast majority of schools are being pressured into these vocational courses of study. Whereas um, upper middle class, upper class students from wealthier households who've gone to private schools, who've come from wealthy suburbs, have high SAT scores as a result, have been you know, tested all their lives and trained all their lives, are going to Ivy League schools, top tier private colleges, a flagship state universities like Berkeley or University of Michigan, and are getting, the, they're still getting these traditional liberal arts. They're still getting, they can major in philosophy because they don't have to worry. They're on a track to get the good jobs, to get into the good graduate schools, to end up at Goldman Sachs or some high-end law firm. Um, and this uh, polarization is really very frightening because um, we don't want to have two cultures in our society. American society is going to fall apart. So I'm glad you brought that up. Sir, thank you for coming. So my, um, my question is actually in reference to the decline in student activism, and so I'm glad yeah. that you brought up the question before that. And um, being in a school like John Jay, where um, I think it's important to know one third of our population lives below the poverty line, and so people are going to school, working, coming back, single mom, graduating in five years, um, seems to be kind of the stories we have here yeah. at CUNY, I guess. Um, and so one thing I've noticed about CUNY students is that most of them want to be active, but then can't. So there's also this decline in student activism, which makes it a lot more difficult for students like us to really speak or have a voice. And so um, an example of that would be a year ago we had CUNY, um, John Jay actually had um, tuition increase um, protests. And um, it seemed a lot dif uh, really difficult to kind of have the hierarchy listen to us, especially since we couldn't follow up being that you know, our student life isn't as great as it would be in Harvard, yeah. Yale, or any other school. So maybe if you could touch up on that or speak up on it. Yeah, um, I often uh, explain to my own students um, when I'm talking about student activism in the 1960s, I tell them about uh, the apartment I had when I was in graduate school. And I went to Harvard University on a, and um, I had an apartment that was five blocks from the campus, which is very well located. Uh, now, admittedly, I didn't have central heating, um, and I didn't have a sink in the bathroom. I had to brush my teeth in the kitchen. But nonetheless, you know, I was a graduate student. It was fine. And um, it cost me $65 a month and I had a roommate. And the fact was that people were, the economy was expanding, people knew there were jobs at the end, they were throwing money at people to go to graduate school. Uh, the draft was a problem, but that was 
you know, sort of the only real world constraint that people had. And of course, you know, you could drop out for 30, what is it, 37 and a half dollars a month for housing, you know, you could drop out of school for a year and spend the whole year just mobilizing and organizing demonstrations. You know, so it's obviously an economic issue and it's um, a serious problem. And I don't know that there's a solution, but it's certainly not anybody's fault that students can't uh, get out there and uh, be as proactive. We have to find new ways of uh, doing political activities, I guess. Maybe not, you know, in person, but over the internet. galvanizing. Um, I think I, I see it as it, this war against public education right. mm -hmm. and sorry, identify myself. Identify myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Blanche Wiesen Cook and I'm, um, I'm the oldest member of this faculty. Um, Right, in a few weeks. And, I, and I'll be here in a few weeks. Um, I don't mean I'm the oldest member of the faculty, but I am actually, I am actually the oldest member of the faculty. Um, I've been here uh, since the beginning, um, and this is my 50th year of teaching. And so let me say, one of the, um, among the many things you talked about, I was really excited. Um, many of them happened here the Marxist study groups, science and society, was located right here at John Jay. Um, it came out of the history department. Marho, the radical historians, right here at John Jay. Um, we were very blessed with a radical dean and some radical faculty, John Kamet, Jerry, Jerry Markowitz, um, and I. We, and we created some of these activist organizations, and I'm glad Somebody mentioned student activism because we need it again, and we need faculty activism again. We have a great union, and the union is protesting something hideous that's happening, which is a deboning of our curriculum. We actually have a plan afoot that says, okay, our students don't need to learn math. Our students don't need to learn languages. Our students don't need to have science with laboratories. And let me put it in a bigger context because it's even scarier. Already, the state university, three campuses, SUNY at Albany, SUNY at Purchase, and SUNY out on Long Island at Stony Brook have ended their language departments. They've closed down their language departments and fired all their tenured language professors. This is disgusting. And so, so there really is a big war going on against public education. Um, Chicago is looking at the closing of dozens of schools. California is looking at, right this week, the closing of 240 schools. They're about to close Flushing High School in Queens and high schools in the Bronx, although I think DeWitt Clinton just got a, a survival day. But I mean, they're closing some of the great schools of this city and of this country. So there's this war going on, and we need activism more than ever. Um, and I'd just like to say we were very blessed a long time ago with you know, people like Minna Reese and Ruth Weintraub who created the city university, and our Chancellor, J uh, our Chancellor Julius C.C. C. Edelstein, who really was the founder of Open Enrollment and the SEEK program. And Julius had a motto, it's better for everybody when it's better for everybody. And so over to you in this great class and to all the activists, we, we've got to get together. We've got to march again, shoulder to shoulder. Um, but I'd like to know your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you've expressed them.
You guys are very lucky to have Blanche Cook on your faculty, as you well know. Um, you're an inspiration to us all, Blanche. Um, and I agree with everything you say. I mean, we've got to do something. It's disappearing. And it's disappearing, of course, into the pockets of that 1%. You know, why? Why? Why are they closing schools? Because students are being channeled into charter schools. Charter schools aren't any better, but some of them provide a profit and they break unions. You know, so it's all the same kind of anti worker, um, anti democratic uh, thing that we've seen that certainly began in the 1970s and just keeps rolling along. Um, comment, and then I'll, what? That fired everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that is, in 1975 and 76, um, as part of the cutbacks that you described so greatly and the threat to the city universities that you described, they were going to close John Jay. Mm -hmm. And Blanche Cook and many others um, and the students and the administration took to the streets and we prevented the closing of John Jay. John Jay would not be here if the faculty and students did not go out in the streets and, and protest. Um, the, yes, and uh, just one little story. We were marching in the streets. We did not have a permit. Marching, <laughs> marching in the streets, and this big beefy cop was standing next to me, and he he said, "The cops are going to get us. The cops are going to get us." <laughs> but in fact, they didn't. The cops cleared the way for us, and we went all the way to the east side to where the board of higher education was. So, just a footnote to Professor Cook and Kwanzaa. Sorry for so for taking. This weekend, oh, hi, I'm Kwanzaa Billy. Um, I'm a child of a family of educators. I'm actually uh, one of the only one, the other one's a doctor, there's only two of us who are not educators um, in my family. Um, that's my family from the South. They te teach at Fayetteville University and here all over New York, principals, um, you know, superintendents, retired superintendents. I'm the, I'm the one who chose uh, to run from my passion, I guess I say, and over this weekend I realized why. Um, I cannot live this way. I cannot be in a system and work every day that debones education. It hurts my stomach. Mm -hmm. It makes me want to physically be sick. Um, so over this weekend, I'm like, what am I waiting for? I'm going to work in education reform. And right now I'm a manager at a bank and I'm dying in there too because the people who, <laughs> um, I started with a mentorship program through Bank of America, that's where I work, and we were told we were going into city schools and we were gonna mentor these kids. I get there, I'm in the KIPP Academy. That's a charter school that they pretend is in the charter school. I'm there for the young lady, I'm there, we're, all the time we're together, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, I was bamboozled. So, um, you know, I'm hearing you to speak. It just, you know, I was supposed to be somewhere else after, for class tonight, um, but I said, I'm gonna make sure I'm in class for this lecture because for me, this was, is the most important one. Out of all the ones, the great ones that we have lined up, I just couldn't wait. Um, that's why I sat there. I really wanted to sit up there, but um, I'm just so excited and like to see Sally in here, Sally. I remember when Sally was trying to get the class together to get people to march and everything like that. I even signed the paper, but what was I doing? I was a full-time student, I'm a manager at a bank, and I'm like, dang, I wish I could be out there with her. But you're, when there's a reason, which to me are the children and even my peers, 
to fight for education, we're going to find ways to make the time. Mm -hmm. We're going to be on change.org. We're going to make our own platforms. But public education will not die. As long as people believe that it's not going to die and know that it deserves life, public education won't die. So I'm not worried. Um, I just hope, I know more people just have to be inflamed um, with protecting public mm -hmm. education. So that's what I have to say. I just want to say thank you all. And um, I can't wait to get started. So, because you got me a little fired up. So, um, I don't know if I should be saying this on camera, but so um, an example would be of something that we're doing that's coming up, and maybe that's why I'd, I was hoping I could get your insight on it, especially trying to do something like this. And John Jay is um, recently um, the higher up, I don't know who the higher up is, but someone made a decision saying that it was the students who chose it, um, that commencement, that people were no longer going to walk in commencement. And for John Jay students, um, this was a pretty big deal. I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, students here at John Jay will no longer walk across the stage to have their names called out to shake the president's hand for their diplomas. And um, so when we heard about this decision, most of us were really, 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 really upset, especially in a school like John Jay where, like I said, one third, of, you know, most of us are first generation graduates, I'll be the first female in my family to ever graduate from college. And, and I think a lot of students have similar stories. And um, so we um, decided to have just a spontaneous, I won't tell Professor Mankiewicz that you are, okay. So we decided to have a spontaneous protest. And I was wondering if you had any insight on maybe how we could strategically, <laughs> I'm serious, to, so we could strategically do this with getting the most people involved. Huh. Another John Jay graduation. Um, I got an honorary degree here, uh, I guess about five years ago. And, um, you know, I feel a very special bond to John Jay, especially its graduation, because I was there. And then when they pulled this thing several years ago with Tony Kushner, was it last year? Two years ago. Um, I actually managed to sort of get a little bit of publicity because I said, I'm giving my honorary degree back. So a whole bunch of other people who've gotten honorary degrees gave theirs back, threatened to give them back. So I guess I've got to give it back again. Uh, <laughs> it's the most useful honorary degree I've ever had, but I wish you guys would stop having Crises all the time. <laughs> What's the reason? What's the um, the graduation takes too long. Money? No, the graduation supposedly uh, takes too long. Yeah, I know that. And but isn't half there the students are gone by the time it's over. Of course it's too long, but it's only once in your life. Yeah. It's an interesting yeah. issue, and I, I think that uh, one way to do it is make sure that everybody knows that a lot of you are upset about it, then some of us will say something about it. Yeah. I'll be glad to give my uh, honorary degree back. But if there were protests, they would probably get offended. Yeah. The students have to promise to stay. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's the they, problem. They and that has been really embarrassing for all the folks who are getting up and getting their degrees. So the yeah. students have to promise to stay um, yeah. and protest. Mm -hmm. uh, during the class that preceded this lecture, uh, my esteemed colleague, Professor Markowitz, made the comment that virtually everything asked for in the Powell memo was achieved. The one that was least achieved was transforming the university. Um, now it's been 40 years since the Powell mm -hmm. memo, and they're still at it. So maybe he's right, huh? <laughs> well, that's one hopeful. I said it, the glass was half full. There, we've heard it. It is true. Universities are kind of the last place where you can get out and debate and 
hear a wide range of ideas and push for them. Um, you know, we're losing our newspapers. Um, we're losing so many other institutions. So we really do have to fight for this one. But you're right. No, I'm not sure. No, no I don't think he is. Oh. I don't think he is. I mean, there's a great big movement of mourning all over the world. Um, the Violence Against Women Act passed. There are right now at the UN, there are women from all over the world mm -hmm. protesting um, sexual slavery, childhood um, abuse. There's a great big movement going on. And there's a new socialist movement going on. Harper Collins is publishing a new book on socialism um, that Fran Golden wanted before she died, the great agent. Yeah. Um, she's 88 years old and she wanted to see a book on socialism before she died. What, imagine it's called, imagine. What would the US look like if there was socialism? So, you know, hey, tax the rich. The 1% can't control the world and Powell's not right. We have to have a movement, but we have a movement and the movement is gonna grow, in my opinion. Pessimism is politically incorrect. I'm not sure you <laughs>